It started so simple to have and to hold, for better or worse, to love and to cherish till death do us part. Love, it's at the center of our families. That love is patient, kind, and gives without expecting anything in return. Love is beautiful, but how do we get better at it? How do we learn to let love work? And our challenge is to figure out a way to make sure that our marriages work. Why is marriage so important? Well, it is something that God created, so obviously it's important, and we have tried to redefine it, but it is not redefinable. Uh, you can try to change things that God has said, and you really can't. What you can do is mess up our lives and mess up our society, and uh, you're going to find out it doesn't work. It's, you know, what God has said is what is true and what works. Why? Because he's the creator. And when we stop recognizing that, we are going to have really miserable lives. Uh, it's the, uh, you know, the Me Too movement, and I, I appreciate anything that would stop uh, sexual harassment uh, and all of that. But I also know that our culture and our society, even Hollywood and and the movies have promoted a hedonistic mentality. And to me, you can't say promote that and everything's fine in the movie. And then when it's happening in real life, we're, we're so surprised by it. Now, I'm not saying that, that women would ever deserve that. And never, ever, ever, they don't. But that's what we've been promoting. It really has. And so... We promote hedonism and people start acting hedonistic and we're surprised. See, God has given us parameters. The parameters are very simple in the Bible and you can mock the Bible and you can mock Christians, but the Bible very clearly says uh, sex is for a marriage between one man and one woman. Outside of that, it is wrong. And you can look at that any way you want to it's still wrong, and it always comes back, the truth is the truth. And uh, that's what we see now in our society. But what about marriage? How can we make sure marriage works? Why is marriage important to us? Because many are married, so obviously it's important to us, but even if you're not married, you know somebody that is. You probably are a product of a marriage. Uh, in, in the future, marriages are what will keep our world uh, going. Uh, it is the, the, the covenantal relationship of a man and a woman for life, that their security for both, their security for the offspring, of course, that's another uh, purpose of marriage, isn't it? For uh, children and for uh, life to flourish and to continue. So marriage, we, we understand and we, we, we see as something that's very important, very valuable, but then why is it so hard? You know, you get married to this amazing person and you just literally are, are head over heels about this guy and you're madly in love and, and you say yes when he pro proposes, probably got down on one knee. And you get married. And then it's great for a while, but all of a sudden you find out what he's really like. And you, you, you find out that there, it's not as much Prince Charming as you originally thought or maybe quite the opposite. How do we get back to the, the days when we were head over heels about him? or you were head over heels about her. How do we get back to that? Is it possible to have a perpetual honeymoon in marriage? And I'm not sure if it's possible to have perpetual honeymoon because every marriage is going to have issues. Why is there always gonna be friction in marriage? Because you have a sinner getting married to a sinner, okay? And if we stop thinking of ourselves as a sinner, then uh, we're really gonna have trouble in our marriage, it's the daily dependence on the Lord to say, look, I, I still have my sin nature, I, I have a new nature if I've accepted Christ, I want to glorify God, and in that I'm gonna walk close to him, then you're still gonna have some friction, but it's gonna be solved a lot quicker. And then you can resolve the issues, you can resolve the argument or whatever the problem is. 
a lot of the problem is that we're not recognizing how different we are. A man and a woman is different. How do I know? Well, because we have different dictionaries. You know, uh, when your wife says, and I'm gonna give you three words that, men, this will really, really help you understand your wife. If she says the word fine, everything is not fine. <laughs> fine actually can have a tone, right? And the higher pitch the tone, the less things are fine. If she says fine, you are as far from fine as humanly possible. If she says, fine. That's more of, okay, let's see how this thing plays out and it's gonna be a disaster. But I just wanna, I just wanna let you, you, you bury yourself with that. So fine, everything is not fine. If your wife says five minutes, she, she does not mean five units of 60 seconds, okay? <laughs> five minutes has been averaged out to be between 15 minutes and an hour. That's the average, it could be longer, usually not any shorter. Five minutes. What she means, guys, listen to me. If you, you gotta figure this out, and I, I know we're kinda laughing a little bit, but I'm kinda serious too. What she means by five minutes is, be patient and wait until I'm ready, okay? <laughs> be patient and wait until I'm ready. Okay, you got that? If you can figure this out, guys, I'm telling you, your marriages are gonna be so much better. And then there's, it's nothing, okay? Nothing never means nothing. Nothing always means something is bothering her, okay? Whenever you hear the word nothing in an argument, that argument usually began with the word fine, and we'll end with the word fine, okay? So folks, understanding the, the language. We, we say things that are a little different than, now you say, wait, wait a second, wait a second. You're a man, you just kind of made fun of the women, uh, we want some payback, okay? Okay, there's payback, I'll, I'll, I'll do it to the guys. Women, there's a dictionary for you too, it's for your husband, and when he says certain things, what you gotta do is look this up and, and figure out what he really means, okay? This, this one's actually, everyone, everyone understands this. If a man says, it's a guy thing, what that means is there's no human rational explanation for about what he's about to go do, okay? <laughs> it's a guy thing. It has no, it makes no sense, it's the stupidest thing, but it's a guy thing, so, Men say, okay, that's fine, it's a guy thing. If a man says, I just cut myself, it's no big deal, usually they mean they've just severed a limb, okay? <laughs> or the opposite, they tell you they've severed a limb and they've just got a little paper cut. I've, I found out that even the toughest of men are really babies, really, really babies. And then um, if a man says, honey, I can't find it, you know what that means, right? the thing did not fall into my outstretched hand. <laughs> I'm telling you, and I, I, I've worked so hard with, on this, honey. Um, I go and look for something, and I look. I spend like, I don't know, 20 seconds trying to find it, and I, it's not there. And then she'll go in, and it's right there. So is that God just kind of saying, look, you guys think you have it all figured out, but you don't. We speak words that need interpretation. Why? Because we are different. We really are. We laugh, and we're going to talk about some other humorous things today. Uh, I was uh, at a basketball game this week, and I was sitting observing some of you. Now, this is the problem when you hang out with the pastor. I might tell about you in church. I'll try to be as anonymous as I can. But I, I, I saw a man... Uh, lean over and ask his wife, hey, did you put garlic in the chicken you cooked for dinner tonight? Now, if you asked a man that, he'd be like, yeah, I put like three cloves in there and I crushed it and I peeled it and I chopped it. I just threw it in there. Wasn't it awesome? Yeah, it was awesome. So what did this wife say? Oh, does my breath stink? <laughs> Same exact question, but we have these different reactions. Why? 
because God made us different. There's a uh, marriage uh, speaker, his name's Mark Gunger, and uh, he, what he did was he created a, a talk about a man's brain and a woman's brain, and although this is humorous, it's funny, just relax, nobody get offended, this is funny, I want you to watch this because we rarely do this in church. We're going to do it today because when you're done, you're going to say, oh, now I'm starting to understand him or her a little bit better. We're going to start discussing men's brains, women's brains, and how they're very different from each other. Now, I want to start with men's brains, all right? Now, men's brains are are very unique. Men's brains are made up of little boxes, and we have a box for everything. We've got a box for the car. We've got a box for the money. We've got a box for the job. We've got a box for you. We've got a box for the kids. We've got a box for your mother somewhere in the basement. We got, we got... We we got boxes everywhere. And and the rule is, the boxes don't touch. (laughs) When a man discusses a particular subject, we go to that particular box, we pull that box out, We open the box, we discuss only what is in that box. All right? And and, and then we close the box and put it away being very, very careful not to touch any other boxes. Now, women's brains are very, very different from men's brains. Women's brains are made up of a big ball of wire. (laughs) And everything is connected to everything. (laughs) The money's connected to the car, and the car's connected to your job, and your kids are connected to your mother, and everything's connected to everything. And it's like... It's like the internet superhighway, okay? (laughs) And and, and it's all driven by energy that we call emotion. It's just... It's it's, it's one of the reasons why women tend to remember everything. (laughs) Because if you take an event and you connect it to an emotion, it burns in your memory and you can remember it forever. The same thing happens for men. It just doesn't happen very often because, quite frankly, we don't care. (laughs) Uh, Women tend to care about everything. And she just loves it. (laughs) Okay. Now men, we have a box in our brain that most women are not aware of. This particular box has nothing in it. It's true, it's true. In fact, we call it the nothing box. And of all the boxes a man has in his brain, the nothing box is our favorite box. (laughs) If a man has a chance, he'll go to his nothing box every time. (laughs) That's why a man can do something seemingly completely brain dead for hours on end. (laughs) You know, like fishing. And 
and, and we love it. That's, that's why a guy can sit in front of a TV and go. actually measured this. The University of Pennsylvania a couple of years ago did a study and discovered that men have the ability to think about absolutely nothing and still breathe. <laughs> you know, they connected all the wires and stuff like that and watched the brain activity and then all of a sudden, he <laughs> I think he's dead! Huh? <laughs> you know, women can't do it. They can't do it. Their minds never stop. And, and they don't understand the nothing box. And it drives them crazy. Because nothing drives a woman more crazy or makes her feel more irritated than to witness a man doing nothing. <laughs> One of the biggest revelations I get out of women is this whole nothing box issue. They just, everything's starting to make sense. <laughs> and I've had women say, oh, it's nothing. Can I go in his nothing box with him? <laughs> no! <laughs> Why not? Because then it's something. <laughs> Besides, you'll walk in there and go, You know, you know, this place could really use some pictures. <laughs> My, nice little table over here, some flowers, is it? No! Nothing! Get out! We don't want nothing! It's true. Doesn't that kind of give a, a little more perspective to, in a humorous way? And by the way, I think we need to laugh sometimes, don't we? We really do. I think in marriages... Uh, one of you was funny at one time, and one of you made the other laugh when you were dating. So try to find that. Find that humor and laugh some. Uh, I'm of the opinion if you don't laugh, you're going to cry. And maybe if you'll laugh hard enough like this, you might cry. The nothing box. It really does explain a lot. So when a woman is super stressed, I mean super stressed out. What they need, what they want to do, is they want to talk about it. When a man is super stressed out, you had a, just a crazy day, a bad day, you get home, the last thing you want to do is talk about it. But because your wife loves you and you love her, you're each gonna offer to them your solution that God has designed you and created you for. So a woman will come to a man and insist that you talk about it. The last thing you want to do, you want to get to that nothing box as fast as you can. And then a man will offer you, the woman, the wife, his best solution. When you need to talk about it, he's going to give you advice, stop thinking about it. Okay, now I know we're generalizing, but I think the point to all this is we are made differently. Nothing wrong with that, we're made differently, we're still the same value in God's eyes, but why are we different? Because in Matthew 19, in verse 4, Jesus said, have you not read that he which made them at the beginning made them male and female? We are different. We are different. Evolution would disagree with that. But God made us unique and different. Just like in a kitchen, you'll have one tool called a spatula, another is called a kitchen spoon. They both are utensils in the kitchen that are very useful, very practical, very important. But they're different. They're, used, they're made for a specific purpose. And uh, you, you also see that in the man's 
workshop, right? Or the woman's workshop. Maybe you're handy and you like that, but you have different tools. You have a hammer, you have a screwdriver. They're both tools that are very important and very useful, very practical, but they were designed for a specific purpose. And so it is that there's a man and there's a woman. They are both equal, they're both human, they're both, there's not one above the other. In God's eyes, we are created equal, but God has designed us with specific purposes and specific needs. And when mankind sinned, when there was sin in the Garden of Eden, before the sin, uh, we were able to get along quite well. We were able to offer what the other one needs. But because of sin, there was a tear in that ability, and no longer was a man naturally able to unconditionally love his wife, and no longer was the woman naturally able to unconditionally reverence or respect her husband. So what we're trying to do in marriage is get back to that. And it's impossible, humanly speaking, to do that, but with God all things are possible, okay? So I think we first must understand that we are made different, but we are both made in God's image. That is so important. What we're not saying in Quint, in Quint Road is that a woman is inferior or a doormat uh, to be controlled. That's not what we're saying. What we're saying is that we are made for a specific purpose and if we will allow, first of all, agree with God in that and second of all, allow him to work in our lives and to, to allow us to do what doesn't come natural in marriage or in other relationships, then we're going to see that we can bring him glory and we can have a marriage that will bring him glory. It says in Genesis 1:27, so God created man in his own image. In the image of God created he him. Male and female created he them. Now we've taken Genesis and we've tossed it or we say it's allegory, or we say it's, it's not intended to be historical or true history, so we've eliminated God's creation in six days. We've eliminated um, Adam and Eve. We've eliminated the purpose of marriage and the design of marriage. We've eliminated the cause of the geologic formations we find all around the world, the catastrophe that the flood has left. We, we've thrown all of that away. We've also, if we throw away Genesis, we're throwing away how we got languages. All of this we're tossing. And by the way, when you say Genesis isn't true, history, you're really undermining the whole Bible. Because what book would you say the, the first chapter is terrible and is not true, but the rest of it's great? We would say then it's, the whole thing is flawed if the first chapter is flawed. God created man in his own image. Male and female are created in his image. In other words, we are both made in the image of God, equal. Also, Galatians 3.28 gives us more detail on that. In the church, it, it says you're not uh, bond or free. You know, it, it, the, the Christianity really levels uh, socioeconomic issues. So you have a rich person, a poor person in this building, in these walls, you are the same, okay? Whatever your education level is, we're all the same. Uh, you know, whatever your, your talents are, we are all the same. Whether you're male or female, it says it right here. Neither male nor female, for you're all one in Christ Jesus. So we're not saying that, that the wife is inferior. We're not saying that at all. What we're saying is God has made us uniquely and designed us for a specific purpose and some things come naturally. For a woman, love comes very naturally. God doesn't have to command the wife to love the husband. The wife should love the husband. It's part of a good marriage, but there's no command for that and the reason is because you can do that. It comes naturally to you. It doesn't come as naturally for a man. It is a little, a lot more unnatural. There was a, uh, I was part of a group and I, w I was listening to a woman that was sharing with the group about the fact that she's been on this, um, this healthy eating program for six months. It's, it's pretty detailed, like you have to track all of the, of the things that you eat, you have to 
uh, go to weekly meetings, you have to cook differently, and she'd lost like 25 pounds. And she told the group, she said, my husband doesn't even know I'm doing this. How is it possible for a husband not to know that she's lost 25 pounds first, but also that everything is a lot different with her cooking and different things like that? Because we don't naturally uh, love as we should. And that's, it's terrible. It, 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 I, I couldn't believe that, but that, that shows our inadequacy, doesn't it? It shows what, what God's going to need to make up in our lives. But we are equal, but we're made different with specific needs. Feminism doesn't recognize this. Feminism, and I'll, I'll quote uh, Sheila Cronin, she's radical feminist, but I'm, I'll tell you what the, the epitome of feminism is saying. Since marriage constitutes slavery for women, it is clear that the woman's movement must concentrate on attacking this institution. Freedom for women cannot be won without abolition of marriage. Now that's sad, but it's a humanistic evolutionary view that the woman is more evolved. And I'm not saying women aren't smarter because they do seem to be smarter, but we're made differently, but equal in God's eyes. Now, what does the Bible say about the woman in 1 Peter 3, 7? And this is a very important passage for husbands to understand and to get. It says, likewise ye husbands dwell with them according to knowledge, giving honor unto the wife as unto the weaker vessel. Now a feminist would chafe at this because they would say this verse is saying that women are weak. There are differences, right, with men and women. One is the physical difference, the, the, the size or strength of a man over the woman. But this is not saying the woman is inferior or weak. This is actually saying the woman is the weaker vessel. The weaker vessel, but not weak. Being heirs together, folks. There's equality in God's eyes of life that your prayers be not hindered. And husbands, if you are not fulfilling the plan and purpose in your marriage to love your wife unconditionally and to show her that, and there's several things that I will uh, share with you next time that will help you know what that means. Because we are kind of clueless, guys. We really are. Sometimes we need to spell it out, and I will spell it out for you. But if you're not fulfilling what God has desired for you to fulfill in your wife's life, this verse says your prayers will be hindered. Why? Because you're not modeling Christ in the church. That's why marriage is so important. Not only does it reflect God in his triune nature, the unity, the, the submission, the oneness, the cooperation, you're not modeling God, but you're also not modeling salvation and the relationship with the church and Jesus Christ. But we're talking about equal. We're talking about this, they are equal in God's eyes. But recognizing that the wife has special needs that a man can provide, and this man has special needs that the wife can provide. And I'm gonna tell you each, men and women, husbands and wife, one thing today, and that one thing will, def if, you'll, if you'll do this, that one thing will definitely change your marriages. I'm not saying perfect. Uh, Karen and I have a good marriage. And leading up, though, to this series, it's, it's amazing how many things that we almost have, have allowed to make it a bad marriage. And I don't know if it's because we're about to talk about marriage and God wants to show us, okay, you think you have it all together? We're gonna have these, these silly little arguments that are gonna start up. Let's see what happens. Or maybe it's the devil. Maybe it's, maybe it's the, the devil doing it to me and God doing it to her. I don't know, but it's, it's interesting. No one has arrived. No one has a perfect marriage. That's not what we're saying. What we're saying is how do we avoid letting something silly get something to be something huge? And it's possible with God's help. It really is. So this is the one thing for you husbands. This is what you need to know. And again, we're gonna flesh this out in more detail later. Ephesians 5.33. Nevertheless, let every one of you in particular so love his wife even as himself. A man has little trouble loving himself, but a man has a lot of trouble agape loving his wife. Agape, if you don't, 
if you don't remember from last time, was an unconditional sacrificial love. That's the agape love that God has shown us, and this is the agape love that a man must show his wife, okay? It's unnatural, it doesn't come easily, we are sometimes clueless, sometimes we're not even noticing, but what we're gonna try to do is help you understand, help you understand her language. Sometimes you don't need to go and solve her problem. She has a need, an emotional need, and usually they need to talk. A man would much rather go over here and go to the, the place where he's thinking about nothing. <laughs> But what she needs right now from you is to show her how much you love her by doing something that's not naturally and listening. And by the way, when she's telling you her problems, she's not necessarily asking you to fix her problems. She wants you to hear her, to listen. And that's what, what we really have trouble with, men, is li just listening. And even this week, I found myself trying to offer solutions right away, just like that instead of just listening, patiently listening. And, and uh, that's how you will love your wife in, in many other ways. And a wife, and this is the one thing that you women need to know, that if you get this one thing right, your marriage will be fine. Okay, the wife, back in Ephesians 5.33, see that she reverence her husband. Okay, this is this idea of a, a, a unconditional respect. Oh, he doesn't deserve it. That's not what this is saying. Does he deserve it or not? This is saying this is what you need to do, women. Whether or not he deserves it. You say, well, okay, so the husband's supposed to unconditionally love his wife. The wife's supposed to unconditionally reverence or respect her husband. I will do it as soon as she does it. Or she'll do it as soon as he does it. Okay, here's what you need to do. Find out which of you is most mature and you start with what you know to do that is right. And I'm telling you, it will change your marriage if you'll figure this out. Now, usually a woman that reads Ephesians 5 that has grown up in our feminist age will chafe at this idea of reverence, unconditional reverence and respect. Let me just say something to women, and really to all of us, about submission, okay? Submission in Scripture applies to every one of us, not just to the wife. We're going to talk about that in a second. But submission is not saying you are inferior. Submission in marriage is the wife recognizing that she's made differently. And this is the, the order and the arrangement that God has designed for us to live in harmony and to reflect him. How do I know that? Because Jesus in Luke twenty two forty two 42 said this. Father, if thou be willing, remove this cup from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but thine. What do we find there? We find submission. Now, is Jesus equally God with the Father? Is Jesus the same level of glory and honor and power as God the Father? If you understand the Trinity, one God, three persons, he is exactly equal. No less, no more God. He is the same, but yet we see Jesus, the second person of the Trinity, the Son of God, submitting. We're not saying not equal. What we're saying is recognizing God's order and purpose. And just like we see submission between God the Father and God the Son, so should we see submission and reverence in the life of the wife and the marriage relationship. We're not saying inferior, we're not saying doormat, and by the way, women, we're gonna define what this means for you. This doesn't mean that if he says, you know, you, you, you know let's say your husband's unsaved, and he says, you know, I, I can't stand you going to that church, I, I, want you to, I want you to skip church. What do you do? We, we have verses that will tell us what to do. And it doesn't mean, because Jesus is, uh, if you've accepted Jesus as Savior, you need to obey him, right? But you can still obey the Lord in submission to your husband by being meek about it. You say, honey, I know that you, you don't want me to go to church, but this, this means so much to me. Jesus is the most important thing, and, I, and if, if I'm gonna fulfill what I need to in your life, I just have to go to church. You're doing it in submission, you're doing it in meekness, but you have 
a higher authority in your life than your husband. But if your husband says, honey, uh, we, we make separate paychecks, I'd like to have one bank account, um, you can't argue with that. You can, but you shouldn't, okay? You say, well, he's too strict with money and I can't spend anything. Loosen up, relax a little bit. Let her spend a little money. Have a, have a plan, and as long as she's within that plan, it's fine. Cheapskate, you know. But the pastor might have to tell him not, not you. So what does submission mean in respect? It means an attitude of meekness, recognizing that ultimately he is in charge, he is the head of the marriage of me, and he'll have to answer to God for that too. See, God doesn't just expect submission and no accountability. No, there's accountability. And the person that, is, that he has made in charge or the head, he's going to be accountable. Now, do we find submission in other, in other areas? We do. We find submission in, in Scripture. A citizen is supposed to submit to the government. You have a child supposed to submit to the parent. Uh, you have each of us submitting to each other. You have the authority of the church, the authority of the pastor, the authority of the elders. We find submission all through Scripture. Does submission, though, mean that you are inferior? No, here's why. We saw Jesus submitting to God the Father, and now let's look at the glory of Jesus because of that submission, okay? Because Jesus said, not my will but thine, he went to the cross, he paid for your sins. Ephesians 1.20 tells us of great glory because of his submission. Do you understand what I'm trying to say? You think submission means I am going to be trampled on. I'm a doormat. I'm going to be controlled. I'm going to be unhappy. My life is going to be miserable. No. That's not what submission means. Submission means in Jesus, read this with me, Ephesians 1, 20 through 22, which he wrought in Christ when he raised him from the dead and set him at his own right hand in heavenly places. This is incredible, the glory because of submission. Far above all principality and power and might and dominion in every name that is named, not only in this world, but also in that which is to come, and hath put all things under his feet and gave him to be the head over all things to the church. Does that sound like submission is a bad thing? No, it's a great thing, it's a glorious thing, and God tells us that he's made us differently and men, unconditionally love your wives, agape love, as we spoke of last time, and wives, unconditionally reverence, respect your husbands. I'm not saying he deserves it. I'm not saying she deserves it. I'm saying that's what God has said. So let's follow what he has said. We need to stop looking at submission as a bad thing and start looking at it as a God-designed order that brings glory and honor, not only to him, but eventually to ourselves, and if we'll do that, we'll be able to have much better lives here and forever. Submission is something that God wants for all believers. And the purpose of marriage is to reflect God's character, to reflect salvation. Jesus loves us, so should a husband unconditionally love his wife. And just as the church honors, respects, and obeys Christ, so should the wife reverence her husband. Do you see it? Do you understand? It's a bigger issue. It's an important issue. It goes counter to what culture and society is telling you today. Submission is the key to the Christian life. And by the way, it's counter to what Satan is trying to do. What did Satan do originally? What is Satan doing today? Rebellion. It's the opposite of what God is telling us. Submission. Rebellion. Do what you want to do. Don't let anyone tell you what to do. You can be like God. Don't listen to what God has said. He's wrong. I'm right. You're right. Do whatever you want to do. That's rebellion. He's trying to get you flipped. And if you'll get back and, and say, okay, I agree with God on this. I believe that, that a wife, I believe that I should reverence my husband unconditionally. And that's what he needs and that's what he desires uh, for a man. Respect is the thing. It really is. If a man feels disrespected, it, it, it shatters him. And if a woman feels unloved, it shatters her. 
So if we can figure out that one thing, that culmination of Ephesians 5, the very last verse tells us, men, agape, unconditionally love your wife, and wife, reverence, respect, unconditionally your husband. Submission. Submission in marriage is the key. Now, let me end with an illustration. There was a um, husband, and he was rude, tyrannical, dictatorial. <laughs> he had a list for his wife that she needed to accomplish all these things. A list. And she was never happy in this marriage. It got worse and worse and worse as he was demanding and, and unloving and, and all he really cared about was getting all of these things taken care of. And it was, it was a really hard marriage, really hard life for her. She stuck with it but he had a sudden heart attack and died. The woman was single for a while and then she got remarried. And this guy she married was a lot different. He had this agape love for her. He was living biblically. He was, he was doing everything that God wanted him to do to meet her needs and it was like the honeymoon just never ended. It was so different. One day, as she was enjoying her marriage and enjoying her life so much better than the previous husband, she found that list that her husband, her first husband had given her. And she started looking at that list and she started checking off all the things. The second husband had not demanded any of these things, but she found herself doing all of these things with great joy. So what is gonna actually happen, men, Husbands, when you do what is right and you love her unconditionally and you listen to her when you don't feel like it, the last thing you want to do is share with her your problems after a long day and a bad day. You don't want to talk about it. Talk about it. Show her that you care. And wives, recognize that there's going to be a day when he shouldn't have to talk about it and just, it's okay to let him do that too. That shows you that you're respecting him. Husbands, you're listening to her and you're sharing with her. It shows her that you're loving her. And if you have this type of marriage, what you're gonna find is the, the, the demands that one husband would give, the wife is going to be fulfilling all of those things without demanding it. And it works. That's the point. It works. If we understand first that we're made different, second, we're made equal, and third, that submission isn't a bad thing. It's actually something that God has designed and created. Do you know Jesus Christ as Savior? No marriage really can be as good as it, it can be before first you recognize that Jesus is the Son of God who died on a cross to pay for your sins. God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten Son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. God loves you. Jesus died for you. We're all sinners. We're all flawed. Every husband, every wife, every single, every kid, all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Let this be sin. All of us have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. God is perfect. God is holy and righteous. Your sin separates you from a perfect, holy, and righteous God. But he loves you. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. This is Jesus, okay? He came, he died on a cross, and if you believe in him, whoever believes in him, he takes your sin, shall not perish, but have everlasting life. How can we be saved from our sin? How can we escape hell? It's when we realize we're a sinner, Jesus wasn't, he died for us on a cross, and you put your faith in him. Then you have eternal life. Then your life can model God. Then your marriage could model God and salvation. And I hope all of us first know that and then I hope all of us can do that. And it takes effort, it takes work. Love works. Love works in your marriage. Would you please bow with your heads bowed and your eyes closed with a private time between you and God? Do you remember a time when you've accepted the gift of eternal life? Do you remember a time when you've said, I'm a sinner and I can't save myself? Right now I put my trust in Jesus. If you don't remember a time, I, I implore you to do it right now. Don't wait. We don't know when our, our life will be over. 
We don't know when our last breath will be breathed. You must accept the gift while you're alive, according to Scripture. Accept it right now. Say, I'm a sinner, I can't save myself. The best I know how, right now, I believe Jesus died for me on a cross and rose again. I trust in him. And if you've done that, you've realized that religion isn't what saves us. It's faith in Jesus. Can I pray for you? Would you raise your hand right now? By raising your hand, you're saying, Pastor Scudder, today I put my trust in Christ. I won't embarrass you. Would you hold it up right now? Is there anyone at all today? Hold it up for just a moment. Anyone at all? Today you're accepting that great gift of salvation. Let me ask for husbands and wives today. I'm not gonna have you raise your hand, but I want you to tell the Lord if you want his help, you want his supernatural ability to do what doesn't come naturally to you, for you men to love her unconditionally, to show that to her, to, to be sensitive, to do those things that aren't natural. Ask the Lord right now for prayer. Wives, perhaps you thought submission was a bad thing and today you've realized it's actually part of God's plan and design and order. And if we will submit in any relationship that God has commanded us to, we're gonna see glory. We're gonna see good things in our marriage now and in our life for eternity. Tell God that you want help in that area. Lord, we're so thankful today that we've been able to talk about love and uh, respect and reverence. Lord, help our marriages and our church to be strong. Lord, for the sake of children, for the sake of bringing you glory to, to showcase you, to showcase salvation. Father, may we all learn to love and honor and respect. And Lord, that our marriages will endure and will showcase you. In Jesus' precious name, we pray these things. Amen.